So, Michael Kostelic, welcome to Noble Week. And you bought uh, art, some artifacts for the museum. What did you bring? Well, <coughs> I brought some, some things representing my two passions in life, or my two passions in life at the time, which are one, a, a rock climbing guide to Big Cliff in North Wales, and some old calculations on something which unfortunately is not what I got the prize for, but it was one of the few handwritten notes that we could uh, find after I had been done a major clear out. <laughs> <laughs> that was what 40 years ago or something, so of course it's had a few clean outs since and uh, old scribbled notes which uh, are all right, may may have may be of some value should I become famous, but at the time, the idea of becoming famous was just ridiculous. So it all went. <laughs> <laughs> and the rock climbing guide, you uh, used to be an, a very avid rock climber. Yes, I had two major passions in life, which were uh, probably well, probably in order. My passions in life were first rock climbing, second physics, and third family. Right. So you are um, awarded this the, the prize this year for the absolute first research that you did um, coming into to the field yeah. that you now work in. Can you can you tell me a bit about how that came about? I was uh, in in doing high energy physics and doing lots of elaborate calculations <coughs> for no return. Then I was a postdoc at, at, in in Italy. And of course, I needed another job, so I, the plan was to go to CERN in Geneva, but I failed to get the paperwork in on time, as is my standard procedure, and ended up at Birmingham University because that was one of the few places uh, from which I got an offer at the very late stage in the game. Uh, Birmingham was actually the last place I wanted to go, but turned out to be the best move I ever made because it was there that I met David Thaulis and we started working on, on, on this problem. Mind you, at the time, it, as far as I was concerned, it was just an entertaining theoretical problem, no more. I had no conception that it could turn into something big, no idea at all. I don't think either of us had and it wasn't till probably about the 80s at the at the earliest that we realized that we'd done something good. So so in this time after you've sort of done or started this research doing the, the things and 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 the time till till you you really realized what it what it was or what it had led to did you think about changing fields again or moving to other parts within physics? Well I did uh, change fields. I, I, I started working on um, what is called non-equilibrium problems, in other words, uh, on, 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 on systems which aren't in thermal equilibrium. And I was hoping to do something as good. I mean, I realized that the work I'd done, we, David and I had done, was actually good work. And I was trying to do something as good in another field, but never managed. So have you, have you moved b back to this, this field again? Is this what you're working on right now? Or? Um, I haven't moved back because I haven't really thought about the field for a long time. And there are lots of other people working in the field you know, who are way ahead, you know, have, let, have, have you know, developed it much further. And so I'm... I guess you would call me the grand old man, or one of the grand old men of the field, who's trotted out from time to time to say some uh, deep words about it. But beyond that, I don't really do much in the way of research in that field. You work with uh, topo topological changes and, and phase transitions. And right. when the prize was uh, presented, the, um, the Royal Academy brought out some some different type of baked goods. Can you, can you try to give us a bit of overview why this would be an, a useful image? Okay, I'll try. 
Let me start by saying that topology is a mathematical uh, um, um, subject which is concerned with uh, really with the shapes of materials, not the detailed shapes, because after all, as far as topology is concerned, a, a plane, you know, a flat surface equivalent to a sphere, uh, which is equivalent to any shape you like. All that topology is interested in is the number of holes in the system. Those number of, of whether it's a classification of shapes which cannot be continuously deformed into each other. Right. You can't have half a hole. Right. Right. I mean, the rules are you can't get rid of a hole. Once a hole is there, you can't get rid of it. Right. Or you can't make a new hole. Now, the connection with what we did is a, is a bit um, um, of a stretch, but the idea is that if you take your film of superfluid helium on a, on a nice flat surface, of course, there are no holes in the surface. And so you, th you, you say to yourself, what on earth has topology got to do with this? Well, in this context, it doesn't. But there are excitations in, in films of helium where the fluid sort of goes round and round uh, a point. These are called vortices. And these excitations do exist. and turns out they are quite important. And this is where topology comes in, because the surface or the manifold in which uh, the topology is defined is this layer of superfluid, not the actual uh, um, the thing, the, the thing that it's supported on. And so if you've got a vortex where the fluid is spinning round and round, Near the center of the vortex, uh, the velocity of the fluid has to go to has to diverge, go to infinity, which means that the material can't be superfluid there. So that is equivalent to a hole. And so, in other words, if you have a vortex produced for, for whatever reason, the topology of the system changes. Right. So you so you get these sort of topological changes in, even in in this type of material. Yes. Was that a was that an intuitive leap? I mean, when you when you first thought of this idea, was that because coming from the outside, it, it seems quite two quite disparate things. Was it intuitive to you that these that this was a ma mathematical model that could be used? Not directly, because to me, the physics was all in the various excitations that can occur. So it's obvious that if you like that the, uh, well known before we worked on this, that a uh, vortex in, in superfluid helium, the center of the vortex was either empty, or nothing there, or it was a no normal fluid, not superfluid. So that part of it is, is simple. And so I, I myself came from, from this point of view. I was only interested in the excitation. Topology I didn't know a thing about. Of course, I had the advantage of working with David Thaulis, who seemed to know everything about everything. And so he realized that this was, you know, he used the word topology. And once he explained what topology meant, it was, ob you know, to me it became, suddenly became obvious. You could call it, uh, call it topology or not, it didn't really matter. Um, but it sounded like a nice way to talk about it. So we called it topological excitation. Are you, are you surprised of how much this field have grown since you've worked in it? I'm amazed because there are so many... Um, the, the, our original paper was referred to so often that it's almost embarrassing. And I knew that we both knew very well that the same ideas could be applied to talking about two-dimensional crystals, at least the melting two-dimensional crystals, because the essential excitations that melted the crystal as uh, you can call them dislocations if you wish, which are analogous to vortices in the superfluid helium. That's as far as we went with the two-dimensional melting. We didn't work anything out. 
at least I did a calculation which didn't go anywhere because we made the assumption that the lattice structure didn't matter. Then we also knew that in principle it could be applied to a superconducting film. So it gave an estimate of what the critical temperature should be and so on. But we never really took it seriously because our argument was that you couldn't have true superconductivity in thin films, which is a correct argument, but we never thought about the question of how, over what length scales, uh, superconductivity could exist. And it turns out that experimentally, uh, if you have a, a system of, let's say, a centimeter, uh, you know, linear size, a centimeter or so, which is big by um, experimental standards, then as far as this system should, should uh, you know, obey the, the standard vortex theory with that where, and the cutoff that is inherent in superconductivity is irrelevant because it's, a, it's of order a centimeter as well. So are there any of these, I mean, there are a number of sort of proposed practical applications for this work and, and sort of moving on and looking into the future, are there any applications that you are especially looking forward to seeing? Oh yes, oh yes, 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 because uh, the uh, hope is that um, the uh, applications in, in quantum mechanical systems will eventually lead to you know, this magic quantum computer. And I've been waiting for uh, my desktop quantum computer. Um, I hope to get one before I die, but I think that perhaps I shouldn't hold my breath and wait for, and expect to get one. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but with the developments in quantum mechanics related to you know, our ideas, it's starting to look like a quantum computer may not be such a pipe dream as I originally thought. So looking at your, your sort of career as a scientist, is there any person that really has inspired you in your work or in your life? Well, lots of people. My, my co-worker David Thalus, who uh, actually first met him as, a gra as an undergraduate in Cambridge in 1961, something like that, and he was teaching us, I think it was mathematics for scientists or something like that. And uh, as soon as he started lecturing, I realized I am the presence of a mind that operates at a different level to, to mine and probably most other people. So, of course, I was incredibly happy to collaborate with David because uh, collaborating with somebody with a mind like that is just an amazing experience. Then there are other people who've uh, certainly uh, influenced me greatly. Uh, there's Michael Fisher at Cornell, who uh, taught me, uh, I was a postdoc there back in, when was it, 1973, four, who taught me about phase transitions and critical phenomena and the importance of um, uh, you know, ex experimental work and how theorists and experimenters should collaborate and criticize each other. Um, then there was John Reppy, also at Cornell, who's also a superb experimentalist and is responsible for the experimental verification of our theory. <clears throat> so I guess there are all sorts of people who influenced my, my thinking and my career, but the most important ones are happened early in my life. And the most important one is, of course, David Fowlis. A bit more personal questions. I, I know you've been diagnosed with MS yeah. uh, some, some time ago. How did you, what did you do and how did you sort of overcome and, and well, handle uh, something like that? I didn't really manage to handle it very well at all because at the time, as I said earlier, my major um, 
obsession and a big part of my life was mountain climbing. And so that I just had to quit because I couldn't do it anymore. It, and it's not easy to continue when half your life is just cut, you know, you have no choice but to cut it out. So I had a great deal of difficulty in coming to terms with my disability. However, fortunately, as my neurologist likes to say, I'm his star patient, so I did my version of MS is at least one of these uh, going, you know, going to the big remission where I come back almost to the level where I was before the attack. So eventually I managed to replace my uh, passion for, for mountaineering with other things. So now I yeah, I do, do work a lot and I travel a lot. And fortunately I've got a, a very valuable wife who uh, supports me whenever, whenever I feel like doing. And yes. keeps on insisting, look Mike, you can do it. It's not as bad as you think. You can do it. Which is, so I, that was very important to me. A final question. You've, you've said earlier that sort of coming into the field that you were awarded the prize for for one of the, the crucial things was your sort of total ignorance of the of the details of, of that field. What do you what do you mean by that? What do you mean when you say that? Well I, exactly what I said because I was a high energy physicist. And so my graduate work at Oxford was all in high energy physics and I simply I went to the required lectures and so on, and there was something called statistical mechanics, which I sort of, uh, it was one of these muddled, rather difficult subjects where it wasn't part of my chosen research, so I didn't pay much attention to it. Um, so then, but statistical mechanics is the, center, is the central uh, tool of condensed matter physics. So when I went to I went to this problem with David Thales, changed from high energy to condensed matter, then statistical mechanics became very important. And was it, was it important for you to sort of look at the problem with, with sort of unconventional eyes or, or oh, un unconventional yeah, yeah. ways? Oh yes, because if you knew too much about it, if you're a normal person like me, you wouldn't even go into the field because there are plenty of rigorous theorems which were interpreted as meaning that in systems like thin films of helium, uh, two-dimensional crystals, they couldn't exist. And mm. there's nothing wrong with the theorem, it's just the interpretation of the theorem that was, uh, uh, was wrong. And so, David, who knew about these things, realized that it was just the interpretation that was wrong. Me, I was so ig stupid and ignorant that I said, I had no idea, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that uh, there was anything, you know, th this lack of long range order was a serious problem. And so, uh, went ahead and basically looked at the problem in, in, this, in a different way and it worked out. Thank you so much for your Welcome. time.